Hey guys, thanks for joining us. We're going to just uh, give folks a minute to uh, hop online and join live. Uh, for those that are just uh, getting a hold of us here, um, I have uh, just a, a real quick, I wanted to let folks know that uh, we're going to be uh, just having a, a quick discussion about uh, the photography equipment, video equipment, that sort of thing. Oh, good question. Best, uh, best fixed blade. Is it best weak fixed blade or... Best fixed blade. Which one? Which one are we wanting to know? Best, uh, best elk broadhead. What, what are we? What are we looking for there? It is going to be a uh, Q and A. Um, I'm going to be doing this uh, solo myself for right now, but uh, uh, we're going to be. Hey, Tiny T. Uh, glad to have you join us. Uh, but we're going to get into a little bit about uh, about this kind of cool stuff and uh, tripods and lenses and. All kinds of good stuff. Um, so we'll kind of go through some of uh, some of the, the equipment that I use, some of the equipment that I'm recommending, and uh, we can answer your questions um, along along the way here. Um, I know we've had a couple questions that were sent in, things like, um, you know, what would be a good setup for under a thousand bucks, you know, for somebody just getting into this, and uh, that's a great question. We'll be talking a little bit about that, um, and uh, hopefully we'll we'll be able to get some of these folks set up that uh, that. You know, currently don't have a camera system or wanted to do more about photography, and uh, we can answer your questions about that sort of thing. So uh, we'll just give folks maybe just a, another minute or so uh, to get joined, and, and then we're going to go ahead and jump right in there. Hey, Remington, how's it going? Uh, before we get going, that uh, question about best. Uh, best broadhead for elk. Um, I'll kind of preface that a couple of different ways. So I've got a broadhead that I've used on uh, uh, pretty much every elk that I've killed with a bow. That's the uh, new archery product Spitfire. And uh, you know a lot of people will say, well, you know, mechanicals, you know, why would you use that for elk? And uh, I actually have an interesting story to, to tell folks about that. Um, so I had uh, a spike that, uh, that I had stocked up to about 20 yards on, and it was in some dark timber. And uh, this the spike was standing broadside. I drew back, and uh, I was at the time. Oh, figured I'd jump on, on for a few. Yeah, happy to have you. Um, so anyway, uh, the spike's about 20 yards away, and in, in this uh, dark, thick timber. And uh, I went ahead and, and drew back, and I had uh, a, a regular broadhead at the time, uh, a three-blade broadhead, also by New Archery Products. And uh, uh, when I shot, um, there was a little tiny branch, like less than a quarter of an inch across. And uh, the broadhead just barely nicked it, and the, the arrow actually went completely sideways, vertical like this, and, and went towards the elk. And when it hit the hit the elk, it smacked up against its body and rolled over the top. And uh, I knew at that point that if I had had a a, uh, a mechanical broadhead because of the the narrower diameter on the front of that thing, it actually would have completely missed that, and uh, and it would have been a perfect double long hit on that uh, on that elk. As it was, the elk ended up getting away, and uh, and I ended up eating my tag that year. Um, it did actually give me the opportunity to get a chance at a seven by seven, but um, that's another story. Uh, really interesting story about uh, about this bull with about thirty cows, and uh, and how he got pissed off at the lead cow and decided to go take off the other direction instead of following the herd. Uh, but that's a story for another time. So um, we're going to go ahead and, and jump in a little bit on the photography question. Uh, you know, the gear that we're using for photography, a lot of people have asked, you know, what, what do you use, what do you recommend, uh, that sort of thing. So let's just jump into what do I, what do I use. So this is, my, this is my main setup right here. This is a Canon 5D Mark III. Um, you can notice on the bottom that it's got a battery grip. And I'll go ahead and pop this open for you guys. So if I open this up, you can actually see that I've got two separate batteries in here. And hopefully the light's good enough for you to tell here, but I can basically put two separate batteries into this thing and get double the life by having this battery grip on there. And it adds a little bit of bulk, um, but it does have you know typical places for connecting uh, connecting tripods. Obviously, the lens itself has um, has a connector for it as well, and I've got an uh, uh, I've got a, a connector for my gimbal head, which I'll show you in a little bit on this as well. Um, this right here, this little round piece on the bottom, uh, this is for a cotton carrier system, and I'll talk about that as well. So uh, 5D Mark III, um, it's a little bit of an older professional camera, it's what they call a full frame camera. And uh, feel free to jump in if you have any questions along here. Um, but with this full frame camera, uh, one of the things that I really like about it is that um, it's relatively simple to use, it's been around for a long time, they're pretty much bulletproof. 
Um, there are some uh, some newer cameras that are on the market. Um, you see a lot of uh, you know Canon and Nikon have recently joined the fray in regards to uh, in regards to the mirrorless. Um, I really like the idea about mirrorless. I think it's a great idea, especially for wildlife photography. Uh, the reason is that it uh, allows you to take a picture without that click 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 noise. And I'll actually um, I'll actually set this up right now. And you can see kind of the menu on the back of this thing here, but I'm going to change this to high speed continuous mode. Okay, so this is high speed continuous, and I'm actually going to take some uh, some pictures just to give you a sense of how loud this thing is. And I'm probably so close in here I can't zoom, but let me. So you can hear it's not super loud, but it's definitely loud enough. Um, uh, Remington asked, how tough is it? Have you dropped it? Um, this particular one I, I've babied pretty well and I haven't dropped it yet, um, but I have had this thing go through several thunderstorms. Uh, both the camera and the uh, lens are relatively waterproof. Um, I've had them in full-on downpours and haven't had any issue. Um, so that was, uh, that was high-speed continuous mode, and there's something called a silent mode, and I'll actually jump over to that one. So this is high-speed silent or silent continuous mode. And I'll go ahead and take a few pictures with this as well for you to listen to it. Obviously it's quieter, but it's also slower. Um, so it's a little bit of a trade-off there. You don't have that trade-off with a mirrorless camera. So that's one of the things to think about when you're considering mirrorless. Now mirrorless generally is more expensive. Um, I'll uh, go into that a little bit later when I talk about recommendations for different cameras to look into. Um, I think this particular body, it's a you know an alloy aluminum body. It's uh, you know it's got seals all the way around it, um, so it's definitely very tough. Um, one of the things that I particularly care for about it is um, that it actually has two different memory card slots, so I can have a compact flash card at, in the camera at the same time as an SD card. So I can actually have both uh, both memory cards in here at the same time. Um, there's a menu on the back where you can switch between the uh, between them fa fairly quickly. Um, so I can just basically hit this button right here, uh, go to the go to the card, and then I can just up or down like that, and uh, I'm very quickly on the right card. So when I fill the one card up, real easy to switch over to the other card without really losing any of the action. Um, so this is a 5D Mark III. Um, I've used this for quite a few things. The lens is a Sigma Sport 150 to 600 millimeter. It's an f4 at the 150 millimeter range, and it's uh, an f5.6 at the upper range. So as you uh, zoom in, which I'll show you a little bit here, uh, the zoom, the zoom capability on this thing, so it it zooms in quite a bit, and uh, it looks a lot bigger in person. Um, the entire setup here. Um, and I don't have the lens hood on it right now. The lens hood would actually stick out about yay much further on the end of this thing. Uh, with this thing in the lens hood, it ends up weighing about uh, 12 pounds. So, <coughs> excuse me, when you start thinking about, uh, about a tripod, you need to have a pretty significant tripod to put that much weight on it and not make it wobbly as you're taking pictures. So we can talk about that a little bit more. Um, when it comes down to batteries, um, I use a multiple battery charger, and these are these you can get just off of Amazon. I actually use generic batteries. Um, I don't think you need to go with the more expensive uh, Canon version. I think these are uh, these are Wasabi. I think for the video camera we've got uh, uh, we've got K Star. So um, don't don't feel like you have to necessarily go with uh, you know with the top of the line batteries. I think for I think the Panasonic battery actually lasts longer than the K Star does, um, but these Wasabi batteries for the 5D Mark III actually last just as long. And I've been really happy with them. I've, I've gone through one set already. Um, I tend to shoot about uh, about 50,000 photos a year. I think last year we said 55,000. Um, plus I take some video on this thing. It's got a video set up as well. Uh, this camera only does 1080p video, so full HD. Uh, but if you look at the 5D Mark IV, which is the next step up from this camera, the, the newest version of the 5D line, um, that one actually takes 4K video. And then um, I'll have to actually pull this thing off and flip it around in order to show you our uh, Panasonic video camera, but that's a whole other beast. Um, so some of the other things that we're using with this, um, this is really our main wildlife lens. Um, obviously we can zoom in really far. Um, it allows us to get, uh, you know, a lot of action with the animals without getting so close uh, that we're spooking them. So that's the, you know, the, the big plus about having something like this. Um, but the other thing is that the 5D Mark III being a full frame, um, the sensor on the back of the thing where it's actually reading the light that's coming in, a uh, full frame sensor gives you a lot more light 
than a lot of other uh, the, what they what we call the crop sensor cameras. So a crop sensor camera, um, you know, you're going to be looking at uh, say you know a, a sensor that's going to be about half the size of what this thing is, and that double the size sensor is going to give you a couple of things. It's going to allow you to uh, blow the image up better, but it's also going to allow you to take in uh, more light in lower light situations, and this camera really excels at that. Um, as good as this is, I think the newer uh, mirrorless cameras are even better. Um, while I'm not currently shooting Sony, I have shot Sony in the past, and I know a ton of people, especially for video, just absolutely swear by the uh, A7R2. So if you're thinking about mirrorless and you can spend the money, the A7R2, especially for video, is a very solid option. Um, another thing to always consider uh, when you're out there in the field, obviously dusty conditions, um, this is just a, a, a bulb that you can squeeze and, uh, and blow. It will help you get dust off of the lens. If you see a little bit of dust on there, you can just very quickly squeeze and get that dust off. It also helps you if you're going to pop the lens off. Dust on the end doesn't really matter nearly as much as dust on the inside. And this lens is actually so heavy that um, you actually want to rotate the body around the lens. So. Here's what the inside of the sucker looks like. Um, so a lot of times before I get started, I will actually blow some air in there, get the dust off before I go out to take pictures, set that down very gently, and then I'll also blow a little bit of air on the inside there. And that'll just kind of help clear up any dust that might be in the way. And then slap this guy back together, turn it on, and we're ready to roll. So that's my current setup. This is, this is what I'm taking most of my wildlife photography with. Um, I do also have a smaller lens. Um, for those that know, uh, we don't just do wildlife photography. We also do product photography. Um, you know, we've done uh, we've done photos for uh, elk calls. We've done hunting videos. Um, uh, pretty much, you name it. Um, you know, we it, it's in our realm in the outdoor space to do photography and and videography. So having a wider lens. Uh, is definitely a huge thing. So this is a 24 to 105 um, f/4 uh, lens. It's the L series by uh, by Canon, which is their highest rated lenses. Um, these L series lenses take super sharp images, and this is uh, a very nice, easy lens to just you know pop the big one off, pop this on, and then any close-up photos that I want to take. Um, you can get uh, you can get filters for it. I always keep a UV filter on every lens that I own. It's not because I necessarily feel like um, I need to protect against UV, uh, but really more as a protection of the lens itself. If I scratch a you know ten or fifteen dollar uh, generic UV filter on the end of this thing, I can just throw it away and not worry about ruining an eight hundred dollar lens. So that's really important. Um, any questions so far as we've talked about the lenses that we're using on the camera side? You guys are going way too easy on me here. Okay, we're going to go ahead and keep going. Um, so what are some of the other things that I'm using on this camera? So I don't know if you guys have ever heard of a Pluto trigger before. Uh, there's a few different varieties of these sorts of things. Um, it's actually kind of cool. It's uh, just got a cable that plugs into the side of this thing and then plugs into a compartment on the side of the, uh, on the, side of the camera. And it just sits up on top of what's called the hot shoe. For those that don't know, this up here is called a hot shoe. Sometimes some cameras have a cold shoe. Hot shoe means that it has an electrical component to it, meaning you can uh, you can actually run electricity through it. It's particularly important for flashes and that sort of thing, um, which I do have a flash and I do occasionally use it, especially for people photography. Um, for those that don't know, I used to do wedding photography as well as uh, senior portraits and, and family portraits and that sort of thing. So um, it definitely gives me a little bit of an edge on the photography end of things because I know how to use a flash um, and I know how to you know get those those good low light pictures as well. So anyway, this guy just kind of sits up on the top. Um, the cool thing about it is that it actually remotely connects to my camera through an app. Uh, there's the Pluto app out there and this allows me to do things like lightning photography. Um, it's got a sensor in this thing, an infrared sensor that it can actually tell when lightning is going off and I can set the camera up to automatically go off uh, using this thing as a remote trigger. So I can set it up, look towards the lightning, get it in focus. Um, and then set it to go off and anytime it set, senses a lightning strike it will actually cause the camera to go off in the amount of time that the uh, that the lightning is actually going off so rather than sitting there and you know leaving the shutter wide open for a long period of time and hoping to get a, a really bright lightning picture I can set this thing up and actually get that lightning picture by using this Pluto trigger um, this is also what I use for time lapses 
Um, within that app, it allows me to um, set up the parameters of my time lapse. Uh, so when we had that uh, that last blood moon, um, I was actually able to get the you know see, get pictures of the moon rising and uh, and actually disappearing as it was uh, going into eclipse. And uh, this this little guy was able to allow me to set that up and do that. Um, you have to use a uh, an application in post edit uh, like Premiere Pro in order to actually grab all those images and put them together into a video. Uh, but you can definitely do a time lapse with these with this sort of thing as well. And um, take a look at it online. Pluto Trigger. It's uh, it's been uh, a nice little tool to have um, in my arsenal for doing some of those additional photos. Um, a lot of people um, have also wondered about, uh, you know, what we're doing as far as uh, getting out and doing hunting photography as well. So. Um, one of the things about being out there, I mentioned memory cards before, you need to have multiple memory cards. Uh, with the memory cards that we have um, in this device, I also have a bunch more memory cards that I, I store separately. This is enough that I pretty much can't fill both of these on a full day of, uh, of photography. Um, however, I can definitely go through the batteries. And so one of the things that we've recently picked up is um, some relatively inexpensive uh, batteries. And these are basically battery backup banks. And I can recharge, say for example, a cell phone um, four times with each one of these things. We've got a couple of them uh, because we have so many devices, so many batteries um, that we're having to charge up. So this gives me a lot of storage if we're going to be off grid. Um, if I want to, I can connect this to a solar system as well. We don't currently have one. Um, but if we end up getting off the grid for long enough, we'll probably end up getting a solar panel, panel as well and be able to connect these. That way we can charge up all of our batteries at night and we can charge these during the day with solar. Um, a new device that we haven't really had an opportunity to test out yet um, is a, uh, a satellite uh, device. So this allows us to do uh, you know, remote texting with our kids, um, with uh, family, with friends, uh, people that we're trying to meet up with out in places where we don't have a satellite connection. Um, this is an older uh, DeLorme inReach that we actually got a, a great bargain on uh, as part of a closeout and we got it signed up. Uh, Garmin purchased alarm, so this is run through the Garmin system. Uh, so um, you can actually, you know, use this by signing up with a Garmin satellite uh, account. Relatively inexpensive, especially if you just need that peace of mind like we do of just making sure that everybody's okay and that if, if there is an emergency that somebody can contact you and get a hold of you. Or if you're having an emergency, uh, did you, I shoot the, the bull behind me? Yes, I did. Um, I shot that bull at 20 yards, called him in as close as 3 yards. Um, but uh, anyway, so you know we have the uh, the SOS feature on here. We have the ability to text, all that sort of stuff. So that makes it uh, really handy for us. We're looking forward to using that the next time we get out there. Like I said, we just purchased that thing. Sup, dude? How's it going? And I'd say your name, but I think this is a quasi friendly uh, <laughs> quasi friendly system. Nice hat, thank you. Yeah, Elk Assassins. Um, if you don't know uh, Trent, uh, really cool guy. Um, Elk Assassins is a really great group. Um, they're they're always uh, doing. Uh, uh, they're always trying to get people up and going on, uh, on over-the-counter elk hunts. And when you sign up for a package with them, um, you can get a hat, you can get elk assassin shirts. I've got both. Um, we joined as a member, I think, uh, just over a year ago. And uh, Trent, Trent runs that. He's a really cool guy. Uh, what speed are your memory cards? That's actually a really good point. So the, uh, um, we've got uh, 120 megabit per second um, uh, CF cards or compact flash cards. Um, in this particular camera, um, these ones write the fastest. I, I can get a, an even faster SD card, but it won't write as fast to that slot as it will to the CF slot. So we made sure that we put more into the, the CF card than we did on the other card. Um, and then as far as the, uh, the SD card, this one's actually 150 megabit per second. Um, like I said, we don't actually need that much. I think 95 would be more than sufficient, especially for the ability of this camera to write to that slot. Um, it writes to the uh, compact flash much faster and it, uh, uh, it caches to that card uh, a lot faster as well. So I can click off more photos before the camera has to pause in its writing capability. So that's a great question. Thank you. Um, we talked about pretty much everything that I've got on here. So let me go ahead and jump into a little bit. Um, you probably heard me talk the last time about monopods. And I've got a couple here. Um, this particular monopod, this is the one that I had on the hunt that I did with Beyond Rubicon. Um, this is relatively simple. It's got three different segments. You can open them up. Um, one of the things I like about this one is that the top of it spins um, and it's got a grip right here, a nice foam, big foam grip right up at the top. So when I was screwing this into my video camera, I could hold this right here and then this extra down at the bottom actually acts as a gimbal. So uh, we had another question here. Save the salmon ever shot a wolf? Um, I've shot a wolf with my camera shortly after they were introduced. 
uh, reintroduced into Yellowstone. I have not shot one with a gun. That's on my bucket list. Um, I definitely uh, appreciate everybody that gets out there and uh, does their predator management and, uh, and especially goes after the wolves. Um, I was having a, a conversation with a uh, pro wolf individual who uh, you know, was giving a lot of misleading information talking about how uh, most hunters are out there and they, they just you know, leave the animal in the field to rot. And uh, you know, I don't think anything could be further from the truth. Every hunter that uh, that I've known is absolutely a stand-up individual, and uh, anybody that leaves an animal out in the field to rot, um, I would call those individuals poachers and not hunters. So, um, yeah, I definitely want to hunt. Uh, want to hunt the the wolves? Uh, probably up in Montana, maybe up in Idaho. Uh, you know, maybe Corey Jacobson. If anybody uh, has his ear, he could take me out the next time he's uh, he's looking. Uh, get both my wife and I out there, and we can uh, chase him with him. Uh, Backcountry Rookies, glad you could join us. Um, we've got a few other people that are uh, continuing to join in. Uh, for those that are just joining us, we are talking right now about, um, uh, about photography equipment and about video equipment. Uh, so if you have any gear, gear questions, go ahead and shoot those over to us. Um, somebody, I didn't see who, uh, mentioned that the, the shirt is awesome. So we are talking about trying to get some merchandise together. For those that, uh, that haven't seen our new logo, this is, this is it, although probably transposed because of the, the camera situation that we've got going on. Um, so we are looking at trying to get something like this made up, uh, maybe getting some hats as well, getting some, uh, uh, some uh, tumblers, uh, some you know, insulated uh, coffee mugs that can be made up as well. So we are starting to go that route. Um, and then uh, we also had recently had a, a meeting with uh, a, a show down at the Backcountry Hunters and Anglers Pint Night, and uh, we had a whole bunch of our photos up there as well. Um, I did want to mention for folks uh, that if you are interested in getting any of our prints, uh, we did set up an online site that you can go and do that. If you click on the link in our Instagram profile, that will take you to a site where you can take a look at some of our pictures. Uh, Backcountry Rookies, I would rock one of those shirts. Uh, yeah, we, uh, we will definitely talk to you about, uh, about getting one of these shirts out um, once we get them, uh, once we figure out the whole printing situation. If anybody does this kind of stuff, the, the, the shirts and that sort of thing, uh, we've been talking a little bit to uh, the folks at Rack Addicts. Um, we've heard really great things about them. We've actually been to their store in St. George, Utah. Um, I, I think uh, Extreme Graphics is the, the printing side of, of Rack Addicts. Um, so uh, we'll be talking to them as well a little bit later this week. Um, they, they've been sending us some emails. Uh, so we are looking to do that as well. Um, anyway, I'm going to keep going a little bit. So we've got a couple of different monopods that we've, we've chosen. This is actually a, a tripod that I used to use. Uh, this is the one that broke when our video camera fell over from a, a super high wind gust while we weren't there to catch it. Um, so I've actually converted, uh, converted it. I've taken off the uh, uh, I've taken off the, the single monopod section that it has available as well, but this is also something where I can screw into the camera, screw into the video camera. And this One of the nice things about this is that it's got a soft bottom. I did run into an issue. If you take a look at the end of these, you see the metal point on the other one. Um, that definitely has some advantages unless you're trying to hunt and you run into a rock. Um, it's really loud. I kind of like the rubber end, end on this one, and so I might be doing more, uh, more of the video with this guy rather than doing this guy here. So let me jump into a little bit more about photography. And this guy here, super big, is a Manfrotto tripod. And this is the Manfrotto 055X Pro. And this is about a $200 tripod. And um, one of the big reasons that we use this guy is because it's so heavy duty. Like I said, we've got, we've got a 12 pound camera that sits up on top of this thing. And I'm gonna go ahead and pop this guy on here real quick. And so uh, we can actually put this on here and we have the ability with this you know, that if we balance this just right, and I'll move this around a little bit, if we balance this right, we can loosen this whole thing up and we can basically spin this thing 360 degrees up and it'll basically maintain that positioning for us. So if we're tracking a bird, we can actually track that bird by locking the elevation in if we want to. If I want to go vertical with the thing, there's an adjustment tab right here, and I can actually twist the whole thing and go vertical. And then very quickly twist it right back and it'll pop right back into place. So having a gimbal head like this allows for extreme movement of your camera without sacrificing stability. So I can take pictures with this thing um, using that Pluto trigger that I mentioned before. I can also actually leave this thing, set it up, lock it into place, and then once it's locked into place like that, you notice, like
like for a short period of time, you see that little bit of vibration there. So I can actually wait for that vibration to settle. I can get my phone out and I can use that Pluto trigger to do uh, remote shutter triggers. So is that the gimbal you got on Amazon? Yes, this is the gimbal that I got on Amazon. So for those that are, that are wondering, that's it right there. And this, uh, this gimbal was, I can't remember, $75 or $100. That's relatively inexpensive. They, they make some that are upwards of four, five, six hundred dollars $600 just for the gimbal head. We're not even talking about the tripod itself. So I actually, um, we just recently got a second one of these tripods. Like I said, the other tripod that we had broke. And because that broke, um, we ended up deciding that we wanted to be able to upgrade uh, to something that was a little more heavy duty uh, to make sure that our equipment was a little bit cooler or a little bit safer. Sorry, somebody said, said cool on there. So um, anyway, uh, so this is the setup on this. The tripod oftentimes come, comes separate from, uh, from the head. This is a gimbal head and we use this primarily for photography. We also have a fluid head on our second one and I'm currently doing a recording up on top uh, right, behind the, uh, right behind the phone uh, that's doing the live. So we have this set up here for photography. We've got the fluid head on another one set up behind me. Um, another thing that I want to talk about, and I'll actually put this on real quick. Uh, this one's called a cotton carrier. So this is a harness that is really cool because this allows you to walk and hike and get out, um, get out in the wilderness where the, where the wild things are and still hold your camera and keep it safe. So we've got our little connection here, and I think it's got a little bit of extra, so I snap it in on the other side. But I want to show you this cotton carrier because this is super heavy. This is about 12 pounds, and I can set it on there like that and be completely hands-free. And I can be hiking, and this thing will not come off. And if this is shaking too much, I've got another strap that I can extend, go over the top of the lens, and pin this thing down to my body. So I have the ability to hike with a very super heavy uh, camera and lens system and be completely hands-free. So if I've got a monopod, I can be using those as hiking sticks and I can walk along. How does that fit with a pack? I actually put the pack right over the top. You see how this comes, the straps come kind of close to me? How the straps come kind of close to me right here? The pack comes just on the outside of that and I can run the chest strap on the inside of it. So this actually works really well for, uh, for a pack as well. Um, nice, how much for this? Uh, it depends on whether or not you get it on sale. I want to say that, um, actually, you know what? I bought this thing so long ago, I don't really remember. Um, I would keep an eye out for, for a sale, but I would go to Cotton Carrier site and actually take a look at these. Um, they sell not just this harness. Um, they also sell another piece um, that I have, but I don't have it attached that lets me put another, uh, another camera on. So I could actually have a second camera um, that connects right here. Uh, or it actually, they also have another piece that allows me to put um, uh, binoculars on as well. So I can, if I'm hunting, for example, and I'm, I'm doing hunting photography, I can have my binoculars here. And how you get this thing out, it just twists and lifts. And you're ready to roll. And with the strap, of course, if you do accidentally drop it, 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 keeps, it keeps it from hitting the ground. Um, Remington from Elcadix asked, you know, if I ever have dropped this system before. And I haven't, and largely because of this. So I can just simply set it on there. Uh, but let me show you that other piece real quick if I can dig into my pack. Assuming I put it back into the right pocket, which is always an F. And unfortunately I didn't. So I've got it in, I probably have it in my backpack, my hunting pack. Um, because I like to, if I don't connect it onto my uh, cotton carrier here, I will uh, oftentimes connect it onto the belt loop uh, for my pack. And I think since we were planning on going turkey hunting, I had it ready to go for, uh, for that other uh, configuration. So if I'm turkey hunting, I can have this, I can have it set up, I can be carrying a tripod or a monopod. Um, and uh, when I get this set up, uh, or the video camera, when I get this uh, set up and ready to go for a hunting situation, if I set it up on a tripod, for example, I still have a place that uh, is carrying my, uh, my binocular so I can be glassing out there as well. So uh, cotton carrier has been just an absolute wonderful addition uh, to my photography gear, especially for getting out there and, and hiking out where those, uh, where those animals are at. So let me go through the list here a little bit, and that's pretty much the gear that uh, that I'm uh, that I've got for uh, for the hunting. And I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, you know the wildlife photography gear that if you're just getting into it that you may want to do. 
And so I've got a separate page on that. So let me talk a little bit about pricing. And, uh, you know, because this stuff isn't cheap. So um, I'll just give you a few uh, real quick pointers on, on some of the, the bigger specifications on this camera. So the 5D Mark III, um, if you look at this new, this is about $2,250. And I'm just, you know, quoting you basically uh, Amazon prices here. Um, and this is a 22 megapixel camera, and it shoots about six frames per second. And one of the interesting things that, uh, uh, you know, that, that folks don't realize when I talk to them, uh, oftentimes, lots of people have asked us about, you know, what gear should I get? You know, what do you recommend? If you want a full frame camera, um, this is a good option, especially for, um, uh, for an SLR camera or a single lens reflex. Uh, mirrorless is a, a little bit of a different situation. I will talk about a mirrorless camera. Um, obviously, I know Canon, so I'm kind of sticking to what I know here. There's good Nikon options. There's good, uh, you know, there's good Sony options out there as well. Um, lots of good cameras out on the market. Um, but you can get used equipment that really hasn't been used very much. Um, this, for, this one, for example, is just the body. So not, not the big lens, but the body itself. You can get pick this up used for about $1,200. Uh, sometimes even less. Sometimes you can find them for about $1,000. But um, these things have a long life. I mean, you can get a good 300,000 photos out of one of these things. Um, I'm really only at you know a little over 100,000 on this. So I've got a lot more time. Uh, to go with this thing, and if I were to sell this used, it'd only be worth about you know twelve hundred dollars. So I could get you know sixty percent of the life out of this thing for you know less than half the cost. Um, if you still wanted a full frame camera, but you didn't want to go quite to this extreme, um, you could look at the sixty Mark II. So that's um, uh, that's the least expensive of the Canon full frame cameras. Uh, 6D Mark II is relatively new. Um, it's a 26 megapixel as opposed to this, which is a 22. So it's a little bit newer than this guy. It's got a higher megapixel. It also shoots at six frames per second. And the 6D Mark II is a $1,300 body, uh, but you can pick them up used for about $800. So um, if you're looking to save a little bit of money, you know, rather than spending $2,250 new for this, you could do a 6D Mark II used and drop that down to about $800, saving you uh, about $1,400 there. So that's that's quite a bit of money that you can put into a lens. Um, and it's actually enough to get uh, to get our main lens right here. So you could do a 6D Mark II with our Sigma Sport lens uh, for the same amount that uh, that we paid for, for the body here. Uh, the nice thing is, you know, costs are coming down and buying used equipment is actually a very good alternative for folks that are just getting into into doing photography. Um, keep going a little bit. Uh, so the next option, we talked about mirrorless. Um, I, I want to say that I think mirrorless is a great option, especially for wildlife photographers. It's generally lighter. Um, this is pretty heavy. The lenses are still going to be very heavy, but the body itself is pretty light, so it saves you a little bit of weight. Uh, the EOS R mirrorless, which is relatively new, is about $2,000. And obviously, I'm gonna, not going to give you a new uh, used price because they really just came out. Um, but that uh, EOS R has a 30 megapixel uh, sensor on it, and it shoots at 8 frames a second versus 6 frames a second. So it's a faster camera. It's got a higher megapixel resolution. Um, and I, I think, you know, for, for people that are looking to get into it, it, you can get into that one for just a little bit less than you can get this one. So I really think that uh, going the mirrorless route may be the way of the, the way of the future. I think the, you know, the bigger camera manufacturers are really looking to move away from, uh, from these types of cameras. I'll continue to shoot this thing until it's pretty much used up. Um, just because, uh, you know, I'm, I'm so familiar with it. Anytime you move to a new camera, you're going to have to get used to the new equipment and, uh, that makes a huge difference. Um, I'll keep going a little bit further here and uh, talk about lenses. So I did talk about my Sigma Sport. Um, this guy is about $1,700 new. Um, you can pick them up used for about $1,200. And then the smaller, uh, the smaller lens for doing you know, close-up photography, for doing product photography that takes really super sharp images. Um, uh, this guy new is about $850, and then you can pick it up used for about $400 or $500. Uh, depending on where you look, as far as places to find used equipment, I think you can, you know, I think a lot of uh, good places out there. Um, you can look at eBay, um, but I, I would really recommend that you look more towards Amazon, look towards um, Adorama, or to B and H. Um, all three of those have a used section uh, where you can generally pick up pretty good buys, and, and they generally have some type of warranty that backs it up. eBay does too. Um, but I just I think it's a little bit uh, nicer to maybe have a place that um, has a bigger business connection so that you have uh, you know maybe a place that you're doing more business. We do a lot of business on Amazon anyway, so you've got a place there that you know you're regularly doing business. You can call them and you know have a bigger customer service that you can reach out to. So nothing bad about eBay. I bought lots of equipment off of eBay. Uh, we bought our video camera off of eBay. Um, 
but just for a little bit more peace of mind, I, I think, uh, you know, maybe going with Amazon or with Adorama or B&H, you know, places that specialize in, in some of this photography stuff might be a better bet for you. And there's some local shops as well uh, where you can pick up some used equipment. Um, I think uh, here in the Denver area, Mike's Camera, uh, and I think they're in uh, Boulder, Denver, and on down to... Uh, uh, Colorado Springs, but they do use equipment as well. So you, that's another place where you can check out and, and maybe pick up a, a relatively inexpensive uh, camera. And then uh, if you really want to go for broke, you know, don't forget about pawn shops. If you want to try to get something super cheap, um, you know, that, uh, pawn shops are always an option. And I just, uh, you know, caveat mTOR there that uh, you never know what you might be getting uh, because they probably don't know how to check the equipment uh, that they take in. And they're just assuming that if it seems like it takes pictures that it's going to work. Whereas, you know, maybe you would look closer, more closely at whether or not a lens has a scratch on it or something like that. All right, so let me just go through the list here. So we talked about the tripod, we talked about the fluid head. Um, I haven't shown you that yet because I do want to still get into a little bit of video equipment. Um, so I'll, I'll have to flip the camera around a little bit and show you the big video camera. I talked about the cotton carrier, I talked about the battery grip and the extra batteries, uh, the Pluto trigger. Um, I didn't talk about rain gear yet, so let me, let me bring that one up real quick. So obviously this equipment is relatively waterproof, which is absolutely great. Um, see if I can find my rain gear because I don't pull it out very often. So I'll show you this guy as well. So given that I have a long lens, I have this guy here and obviously the lens sticks out of the front of the thing. Um, so I have the ability to put this over the camera, manipulate the camera. So in a super heavy rain, I can actually be looking through this plastic right here. I can see the viewfinder and yet I can still be manipulating the camera and taking pictures. Again, that's really where the gimbal head comes into play, that having it up on a gimbal head keeps it steady, even though having this piece of plastic on the end may end up uh, causing some manipulation of the camera. Using the gimbal head um, allows you to manipulate it without it becoming super shaky. So this has been a super nice addition if I get into a big thunderstorm. Appreciate my wife. Uh, Backcountry Rookie's got to go. Thanks, Lauren. I'll watch the rest tomorrow. Sounds good. We'll get uh, we'll get the rest of this posted up on, we'll get the whole thing posted up on uh, YouTube here uh, not too much longer. Um, so anyway, rain gear for this, uh, rain gear for the video camera is relatively simple. Uh, let me pull that guy out. This is actually a uh, camera bag cover. So um, we actually set this over the vast majority of the camera. Um, obviously, uh, you know, the rain, uh, this keeps most of the rain off. If it's going to be a super heavy downpour, um, then you may need to bring something like uh, some saran wrap and saran wrap the end of the thing to make sure that just the lens is sticking out. Um, you can put some saran wrap over the, uh, 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 the part of the video that you can see, um, and that'll allow you to continue to look. Uh, let's see here. Uh, Gaith has to go too. Good night. Thank you for the info, man. You bet. Uh, check out our YouTube channel. Um, this will go up there. We've got another uh, video up there. Plus, you can get a whole bunch of our wildlife videos. Um, YouTube.com forward slash Good Bull Outdoors or just search Good Bull Outdoors and you'll find us on there. So we talked about rain gear. We talked about the dust bulb. And uh, now we will jump into video equipment a little bit. So I'm actually going to have to kind of come around the camera a little bit here and show you our video setup. And sorry I'm shaking this up so much guys all right so I'll flip this guy around here and this is our video cameras this is a Panasonic HCX1 you see we've got tons of buttons on the side over here uh, lots of different things you've got uh, you open this section up here and you can actually see different uh, channel settings so we've got audio settings for channel 1 channel 2 different mic inputs um, settings for optical image stabilization, um, whether or not we want to switch from the LCD to the viewfinder, which is up here. Um, we've got focus assist buttons. We've got ND filters. This tells the, the camera to make it lighter or darker. Uh, filters out some of the extra light if you need to. Uh, menu settings. Um, I'm actually going to flip this viewfinder around here so you can see here, you know, on the viewfinder it's got things like, you know, here you can see how much the audio is. Uh, battery settings, it tells you that it's recording right now, and you see that P record, that's actually a very interesting feature, it's called a pre-record, so it's actually recording before you ever hit the record button, very cool. Um, tells you how much time you have left on your memory cards, 
I'll show you over here. It's showing you that it's recording to memory card one. We actually have two different memory card slots and these are set in tandem. So I can actually record and it will automatically jump from this card to this card. You also have the option of, with this particular video camera, you have the option of switching and um, you can record 4K to this one and you can record 1080p to this one. So I can be recording 4K 60 frames a second on here if I wanna get 4K slow-mo or I can switch over uh, and, and at the same time be recording uh, 1080, I'll say 1080 at 24 frames a second for just regular video. It can make editing a lot, a, a lot uh, simpler. And then over here you can see we've got a road mic. Um, so this is actually taking audio. Um, and it's a very high quality audio because I'm shooting indoors. I'm not using uh, this little guy here um, This helps to kind of knock down some of the wind and helps kind of keep some of the uh, some of the weather off it if it's snowing uh, Particularly this helps kind of keep the snow um, out of the little, uh, you know rivulets here that uh, that are uh, part of the sensor so this is our video camera setup. You can tell it's 20 power optical zoom uh, because we shoot in 4K and we can bring that down to 1080. We can actually get really good, uh, we can actually get really good video uh, in, in 1080p and up the, the digital zoom factor as well. So uh, that's super important for hunting uh, videography as well. Uh, that hunting videography, you know, being able to bump it up to say 80 power zoom uh, because uh, you know, 4K four times uh, HD quality. Um, it gives you the ability to zoom way in there and so you can see the shot. Um, we did a, uh, an archery hunt and uh, you know, you're able to zoom right in on the animal and see that, uh, see that arrow impact. Um, but you're also able to zoom right in on, on wildlife without getting very close to them and uh, super important to do. We can also use this for, uh, for scouting for sheds because we can zoom in so much it basically acts like a spotting scope as well. And it's with a super low, uh, low light capability on this thing we can uh, probably uh, you know, use it as a spotting scope later than we could an actual spotting scope itself. Um, not to say that I have any problem with digiscoping. I think it's really great, um, and I would definitely, uh, uh, I would definitely let you know that um, with the digiscoping, uh, that it's still a viable option out there. Being able to, you know, record your your hunts for those that have a, a spotting scope. We're still planning on getting a spotting scope. Um, this is just another option out there. If you're going to invest the money in a video camera, if you have one that can zoom in that far, um, then you can use it for dual purpose, and, and you've got a single a single device that you're carrying that allows you to. Um, to do essentially what that uh, spotting scope can do. Um, the only caveat there is that your eye can maybe pick up a little bit more light than, than what a video camera uh, sensor can record. So we have a very big uh, sensor on that one. Like I said, the bigger the sensor, the better the low light capability. Um, your eye is an incredible sensor and, uh, and being able to look through a spotting scope really allows you to do that as well. So. So that, that's our camera. It's a Panasonic HCX1. Again, um, you can buy them for about $2,700. Um, Holly said, uh, love your videos. Uh, thank you. We really appreciate that. Uh, Smo Elk Calls, uh, good stuff. Thanks for sharing. You're welcome. Um, again, we'll be putting this up on our YouTube channel uh, so you can kind of get a gear review um, on the photography stuff. We will also be having a gear review talking about hunting stuff later on, but, uh, uh, but we haven't done that yet. Uh, Estes got a lot of snow today. Yeah, I heard they were supposed to get like 12 to 18 inches today. So hopefully the, the elk have been packing in the nice green grass that's been coming up up there, and, and they're going to be get, getting through this just fine. Hopefully it just makes more grass for them and, and better animals growth as a result. So this is obviously a very expensive uh, camera. It's a professional level camera. I would say it's at the bottom end of the professional level. Um, it's certainly not a, a red camera. Um, there are cameras out there that are shooting in, in uh, 8K and higher. Um, there's cameras that can shoot in 8K and uh, you know 400 frames a second. Um, so there are definitely higher end options out there. But for an all-in-one that's uh, under that $3,000 price point, um, we really couldn't find one that was better than this. So, um, so definitely think about that if, if your, your price range is going up to the $3,000 and you want to get a, a semi-pro or a low-end pro uh, video camera. It's an option. Uh, for those of you out there that are just looking to add something in and... Uh, you know that might be doing some some basic photography but are looking to also jump into into video videography or to video a hunt um, you know a lot of people ask well you know what's a good video camera that i can get that uh, isn't going to break the bank and so i did a little bit of looking and uh, for those that are interested the uh, sony fdr ax 53 once again that's the fdr ax 53 it's about 800 dollars new um, it's going to be a 4k at 30 frames a second um, you can do full uh, HD at 120 frames a second. It's going to have a smaller sensor, but it's going to have almost a, um, 
uh, it's going to have a, a better stabilization than our bigger camera will. Our bigger camera is really designed more to be worked on a tripod, whereas these are really designed um, to be more handheld. They're, they're honestly about the size of this lens right here. So they're super tiny, they're super light, they're actually you know, designed to be handheld and, and yet maintain that stability. Um, they've got great zoom on them, again 20 power uh, optical zoom on these. Um, I'm not sure if there's a hot shoe on that particular model and the reason why I think that's a bit of an issue is that if you're going to be doing hunting uh, videography, you really want to get um, an additional microphone, something like that Rode mic, uh, something maybe a little bit smaller for a camera that size, but you want to get professional level audio because the audio really makes a huge difference. Um, the better the audio, uh, the better your uh, people can connect, the better they can hear bugles and that sort of thing that uh, really help put you in the moment there. So uh, that's really kind of a huge deal. Um, and if you don't have a hot shoe, you really don't have anywhere to connect that. Um, the other thing to consider as well is that if you're going to be filming somebody, somebody else hunting, um, you want to have the ability to connect um, a lavalier mic, a wireless lavalier mic. So um, an individual that has a, a wireless mic that's, you know, they've got a little wire that runs to a mic that you just kind of clip on their collar right here, and then that'll send a signal up to 300 feet away that you can attach to the camera and then send the, send the audio signal in there. So you can be using the inboard audio on the video camera itself, but then also using the remote mic and then you can get both sound from somebody that's far away, also the sound that you've got up close to you, and it presents a really uh, cool way of doing post-editing where you can hear somebody that's a long ways away. Um, so Holly said, I still use my 1980 Nikon with various lenses, old school. Yeah, I still have my Canon AE-1, um, which is a film camera, which uh, is the camera that I started out on. Um, I don't still use it. But, uh, you know, film is still a really cool way to go, um, especially if you've got a darkroom. And I think you can still get darkroom equipment fairly cheap if you can find all the, uh, the processing material. So, uh, let's see here. So, uh, C. Mahoney Photography asks, what about carrying gear in the field? So that's actually a really good question. And uh, now is actually a really good time. If you guys want to submit questions, um, I'll start getting into, uh, I'll leave a little bit of time here for you guys to ask any questions that you have. Uh, but for this uh, question from C. Mahoney ph Photography, um, I mentioned the, the cotton carrier, uh, but if I'm going to be carrying my equipment in a backpack, like in a hunting situation, and I don't actively have it out, and I'm not actively running around with that uh, video camera or, uh, or, or my actual camera itself, uh, I, I usually end up just storing it wrapped up and closed within my backpack. Obviously, space is a bit of a concern. I do have a low pro backpack, and I'll, I'll show you this real quick. Um, but this thing is a bit of a beast. It is it is literally huge, and I can fit both my big video camera and I can fit uh, my my regular camera uh, both at the same time in there with the lenses, uh, with the the microphone, all of this, um, all of this sticking in here, and uh, you know that. Um, that allows me to carry a lot of gear, but it's really meant more for safe transportation to and from. Once I get out in the field, um, I really uh, don't like carrying such a heavy pack. Um, I really like to, uh, and C. Mahoney said, I love my uh, cotton carrier. And th they make more than just a harness. They make like a, they make one that's got a sling where it just kind of sits right here. They've got another one that will attach to the a pack, uh, to the, the strap for your pack. So look at the different options they have. They've actually got some great options out there for, uh, for folks for carrying their, their camera gear, depending on how heavy uh, that gear is and whether or not you need, you know, to be carrying multiples. Uh, a lot of photographers I know, they'll carry the big one, um, you know, on the center chest strap, and then they'll carry a wide angle lens um, with a second body down on their hip. That way, if an elk or another animal is moving towards them, they can, you know, set down the big lens that's, that's too close now, and they can switch to the wide angle and pick up the whole scene. Um, but as far as those hunting situations, we actually just take the camera, um, we wrap it up, wrap our lenses up in, in uh, basically the same clothes that we're going to be carrying out there if we're going out for a multi-day excursion. So uh, we'll just wrap it up, we'll stick it in the pack, and, and the pack provides enough protection for it that uh, we don't have to carry you know, additional packs or any additional gear. Um, you know, we've got places for our tripods and side pockets are clipped to the back, and so um, it's pretty much just that. Um, Holly asked, where is my better half? I love listening to her. Um, unfortunately, she's a little bit busy right now, so she wasn't able to join us for, uh, for this one. She actually had uh, a whole bunch of stuff that she wants to talk about related to uh, camo, related to hunting, related to boots. Um, we're we're going to have another gear session at a, at a future time, and, and she will feature prominently in that one. And, and I enjoy listening to her as well, so uh, she's just a little bit busy tonight. Um, 
And then uh, Hoka Whitetails was the one who asked about the recommended camera setup under a thousand dollars. So, um, so that's pretty much it. Um, I, I, you know, feel free to shoot me a, a, any other questions that you have here over the next couple of minutes. Um, I just want to let folks know that if you have any questions, yeah, love uh, love hearing other women hunters. Uh, she's got some really great perspectives, especially on women's camo. Um, she had a fantastic conversation with Amanda Caldwell, um, who helped design the women's line over at Sitka. Um, and so I, I think she'll be happy to share some of those experiences. I don't want to talk uh, for, you know, on her sake about the women's stuff. Um, I think she's got a great perspective about it. I, I think, uh, uh, you know, I think a lot of women would really benefit from hearing some of the stories that she's had um, with, with dealing with, you know, the women's lines and dealing with men's clothes, you know, when she first got started. Started and that sort of thing. So um, I think she's got a fantastic perspective and, and uh, I can't wait for her to be able to share that with you guys, uh, especially for the women. I will also say that, uh, you know, for those women that follow us, um, you know, please have your friends join us, uh, if, you know, follow us along as well. Um, you know, when we first started this thing, we were running about 24, 25 percent uh, female following. And as we've continued to grow, and I think it's just a, a matter of that there's simply fewer, you know, women out there in the hunting industry than men. But as we've continued to grow, um, we're down to now to 15% following of women on Instagram. And it's not because we're not women centric. It's not because we don't have a strong uh, pro women in the outdoors uh, bias. We definitely do feel strongly about getting uh, women and kids out in the outdoors. We feel like it's definitely a place for them. And it's a place for the whole family to get out there. Uh, but women, you know, we want more and more women to get out there uh, out hunting. And, uh, and we'd really like to see more women following us as well, because I think they would learn from, uh, from Allie's perspective. You know, she's, she's been uh, amazing at navigating this and she's got a much greater sense of um, understanding of what these different uh, camel lines um, have done and have developed uh, than I do. I, I just, I simply haven't experienced the same problems with her, uh, you know, with camel that she has, because, well, frankly, they've been making guys camel for a long time. Um, you know, if you, if you look at some of these different camo lines, they, uh, you know, some just have no interest in having a woman's line. Others have an interest, but they simply haven't gone to the point of, of going that route. And there's going to be a huge hurdle when, once they do. They're going to have a development hurdle. Um, I know that Sitka did. Sitka's had to continue uh, modifying their women's line as they go along, and it keeps getting better and better. Um, and uh, I know that First Light as well has uh, has modified their stuff a lot. And they've got a lot of female input, and and uh, you know Allie will be happy to share uh, her experiences with those two brands. Maybe with Under Armour as well. She's had some Under Armour gear in the past, so that's that's huge. Um, let's see. Holly said, "I'm having my friend Kim join. She's a huge hunter in Alaska. She bagged a huge, and I mean huge, moose. Uh, put most men to shame. You, you know, I think women are oftentimes better hunters than men are." Um, I know that uh, Allie has shot a better mule deer, or I'm sorry, a better whitetail than I have um, with her bow, and she's a fantastic bow hunter. Um, she's had some issues, uh, you know, with being able to uh, get her draw weight back up. Um, I'll let her talk about that again, but um, let's see. See, Mahoney said, I'm excited to hear her uh, advice. Uh, shrink it and pink it doesn't work. No, it absolutely does not work. And unfortunately, that's really been the mantra. Uh, of the outdoor industry for way too long. Now as more women are getting into the outdoors, I think there's there's really a place for uh, women specific lines. Um, I know there's there's Proas out there and uh, you know really grateful for companies like that that are developing women specific lines. Um, the the pink it and shrink it thing is just uh, uh, you know I think that was the mentality. Oh, we just you know fit you into a boys uh, a boys large and that's gonna that's gonna work for all women. It it absolutely doesn't. Um, it makes an awful hunting experience and it's keeping women from joining the outdoors. The more women specific gear there is, the absolute better it's going to be for women in the outdoors. So uh, we need to we need to make that happen. We need to see that happen. And, and I think Allie's perspective will be uh, excellent for anybody that wants to, uh, you know, join in and hear a discussion about uh, women's women's outdoor gear, you know, from boots to, uh, you know, boots to pants to, you know, the, the full uh, the full line of, of gear that's out there and available. So um, that's it. Uh, we're going to go ahead and wrap it up here. If you have any more questions about gear, about cameras, about uh, video, uh, videography, uh, feel free to shoot us a DM. Um, don't forget we've got a Patreon page. Don't forget that link in our Instagram profile. It's going to take you to where you could potentially purchase uh, uh, some prints from us. We've only got about 20 to 25 images up there right now. We'll be adding to it as we continue to kind of clean up our images and get them cropped down to photography size. But uh, we've got some great options out there for folks who want to support us. Um, just really appreciate everybody that joined today, everybody that's going to be looking at this um, after our live is over and uh, youtube.com forward slash goodbulloutdoors. 
uh, for uh, for the video that's, that's going to be posted up if you didn't get a chance to catch us tonight. Thank you. Really appreciate it, guys.